So if you have your Bibles or your phones, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is where I want you to turn your attention. But as you're turning there, I want you to imagine with me being in an underground church in China or a country in Asia where the gospel is not permitted or in the Middle East. And you're a group of believers, maybe 10 or 12 people, coming together in a home to study God's word, to pray, and to worship. And imagine with me, all the blinds are closed, and you're gathered there together with all the people who've come at a risk of their lives to come and worship. And that morning or that evening, the lesson that you're hearing or the sermon that you're hearing is on baptism. And at the end, there's a few people that say, hey, I want to get baptized, and you see them walking up and the question is asked, are you willing to be baptized today, even if it means you could possibly lose your life for doing this? Even if it means that because of your obedience to Jesus, it doesn't mean you have wealth and blessings and prosperity, but because of your obedience to Jesus, it could actually cost you everything. And so this morning what I want to do is I want to Look at baptism from a perspective of what does the Bible teach? Um, because when you look at it that way, your view of baptism will completely change and it will challenge you. It will change the way you view it. Not the meaning of baptism. I believe that's pretty clear in Scripture, but the significance of baptism, why it's so important. There are many parts of the world where it's totally fine to give your life to Jesus you can accept Jesus as your Savior, that's fine. You're just adding him to as one of your many other gods. Um, but if you ever make that decision to get baptized in water, then it's you lose everything. And so it's a pretty serious topic. It's a significant topic. And I've met individuals in those parts of the world that had similar experiences to what I've talked about. That was the questions that were asked before they were baptized. And it challenged the way that I look at baptism and the emphasis that we put on baptism at a local church. It's not just, hey, whoever wants to get baptized, let's just get baptized. It's a significant moment in the lives of individuals. I think somewhere along the line, we have some misunderstandings about what baptism is. It's been maligned in the history of the church. So somewhere along the way, we miss out on the significance of what baptism is in Scripture and in the church. And so what I want to do this morning is based on Scripture and the his testimony of brothers and sisters around the world who are giving their lives for the gospel. I want to revisit baptism, what it means for us this morning. There's a lot of questions that you guys have about baptism. So what we have in this morning and you have in your bulletin is a bunch of questions that I just want to answer and then dive into Scripture and get answers this morning. And we're going to use Acts 2 as a base to launch into the rest of Scripture and see what the Bible teaches about baptism. So Acts 2, we come to verse 36, and this is Peter preaching the first Christian message sermon on the day of Pentecost. He's preaching to thousands and thousands of people who are watching their lives being changed, and he gets to the climax of his message in verse 36, and I, wanna, I want you to listen to what happens. He says in verse 36, it says, Let all the house of Israel know therefore for certain that God has made them both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Verse 37 says, When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what do we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and all who are afar off, Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. I don't know if you caught that, but he's talking about us there in that verse right there. We weren't there that morning, but he was speaking prophetically even for us. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourself from this crooked generation. And look at verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added to that day about 3,000 souls. From the very beginning of the church, what we see is that when people profess their faith in Jesus, immediately they become baptized. What we see in Acts is a lot of emphasis on the significance of baptism. So this morning we're going to dive in 
And we're going to try to get through the cloud of church history for the last 2,000 years and see how significant baptism is in the New Testament church. So let's dive right into the first question. The first question there is, why should I be baptized? Why should I be baptized? And I think the scripture gives three main reasons of why we should be baptized. The first is so that we could follow the example of Jesus. We get baptized so we could follow the example of Jesus. In Matthew 3, there's a guy by the name of John the Baptist. He was going into the Jordan River, and he was baptizing people left and right. And all of a sudden, one day, Jesus shows up. And he comes down to him, and he says, hey, I need you to baptize me. And they have this sort of argument back and forth. John says, no, I, I can't baptize you. You need to baptize me. And they're just going back, back and forth. You baptize me. No, I, you baptize me. And they're just going back and forth. And John is arguing with Jesus. And let me tell you, that's not a good thing to do, or to argue with God, right? And so finally, John comes to his sense and says, all right, I'll just be obedient and do what you're calling me to do. And so John baptizes Jesus there in the Jordan River. What's going on there? Up to that point in the history, in the Bible, we don't see baptisms happening. Up to this point in history, you were part of the family of God because you were born into the family of God. If you were a descendant of Abraham, if you were an Israelite, you were part of the family of God. Now, all of a sudden, John comes onto the scene, and what he's saying is, this is not something you're just simply born into. You're not a child of God simply because your ancestors were children of God. You're not a child of God because your father or your mother goes to the temple every day or um, prays every day. This is something that has to happen inside of you. There's a change that needs to happen inside of you. So John begins to preach this message. He says, you need to repent of your sins. You need to turn from what you're doing, and you need to be baptized. He's saying that you need to practice faith in Jesus or faith in God, and you need to repent. It's a symbol that you're not going to trust in yourself. You're not going to trust in your works. You're not going to trust in your abilities. You're not going to trust in your prayers. You're not going to trust in your how often you go to church. You're not going to trust in how much you give. You're not going to trust in anything else. You're just simply going to trust that Jesus and Jesus alone is worthy and able to save you. That's it. It's the inaugurating, inauguration of a new community, a whole new people of God. People aren't born into it anymore. There's a new birth that happens, a transformation that happens where your life is changed and something begins to happen in you and you become obedient. And now all of a sudden, Jesus shows up on the scene. Listen, Jesus had nothing to repent of. The dude was perfect. He had no sins to confess. He had no sins to be forgiven of. So John argues with Jesus, rightfully so, that Jesus doesn't need to be baptized, but that John needed to be baptized. John, who was a sinner, John, who committed sin, needed to be baptized by Jesus. And what we see Jesus doing there is that when Jesus gets baptized, it inaugurates him as the leader of a new community of faith called the church. So the first reason we're baptized is because we want to follow the example of Jesus. There's a second reason. The second reason we're baptized is so to obey the command of Jesus. To obey the command of Jesus. One of the words that Jesus, one of the, one of the last words that Jesus said on the earth before he ascended into heaven was the Great Commission. And in that commission, he tells his disciples, go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Last words of someone are pretty important. And these were Jesus' last words to his people. He said, here's what I want you to do now that I'm about to leave you. I want you to go out. I want you to lead people to me. I want you to tell them how good and how great I am. And then I want you to make disciples, and I want you to baptize them. And that's what you see when you get to the book of Acts. When you see that when someone puts their faith in Jesus, they are baptized. And we're, we're, we're going to look at that in, a depth, in depth in a moment. But it becomes a pattern in the early church. People knew that when someone put their faith in Jesus, the automatic result, the expectation was that they would obey the command of Jesus and get baptized. So the second reason is that we obey the command of Jesus. And let me pause there for a second, because before I go into the third reason, I want you to see that these two reasons that I've already mentioned are primary reasons that we need to be baptized. These are the main reasons. Jesus did it. Jesus told us to do it. I mean, there's, there's no better argument than those two things. And the primary overarching reason that we need to be baptized is because we want to be obedient to Jesus. That's important because in a second we're going to talk about how I believe baptism is 
it, according to scripture, relates to church membership and being a part of a church. But it's also important to realize from the beginning that we aren't baptized to join a church. We're baptized to obey Jesus. Baptism isn't about church membership. Baptism isn't about being part of the group. Baptism is an obedience issue. It's about obeying what Jesus said. And if we haven't been baptized, can I humbly say to you that you are being disobedient to Jesus according to Scripture? And that is a much more important discussion for us to have than a church membership discussion. Keep that in mind because the third reason that I believe Scripture teaches why we should get baptized is so that we can be united with the family of God. United with the family of God. The book of Ephesians, Paul is writing to a church that's struggling to be united, and he says to them, guys, we're, we believe in one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father who, of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. What Paul is saying is this act of baptism is an act that unites us as a body of believers. It makes us one. Listen, regardless of our age, regardless of our gender, regardless of our race, regardless of our ethnicity, regardless of where you are socially, economically, regardless of where you grew up or who your parents were or what bad sins you've done or how good you were or anything like that, what makes us one is when we are united in baptism and publicly identify with Christ, but not only with Christ, but we also identify with one another. We say, I'm part of the family. I'm all in. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. We're in this together. And when we see baptism happen here this morning, it's a picture of unity in the church because all of us who have placed our faith in Jesus have made the decision to be baptized. It says we're united. All right, so now based on those three reasons, to follow the example of Jesus, obey the command of Jesus, and to be united with the body of Christ, I believe baptism is important to be a member of a church, and here's why. Some of you automatically think, I don't think it's right to be baptized to join a church. Exactly. We're not baptized to join a church. We're baptized to obey Jesus. I emphasize that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we disconnect baptism from church membership. And think with me for a second. Church membership, what is it? There's no word in the New Testament that talks about membership, but we see it emphasized in the New Testament, especially in Ephesians, where we see that we are united into a local church and what we call membership today. It's basically a covenant, an agreement, a commitment between believers, between children of God saying that we are united in our love for Jesus, we're united in our love for one another, and we're united in our desire to see the world know about Jesus. It's a commitment that we make on that. And if we are committed, if you're a part of that church, to support each other, to encourage each other, to build each other up, to together accomplish the mission of Christ, that's what church membership is all about. So if you have that kind of commitment to Christ and to his church, and you are involved in being a member of the church, and then you have baptism on the other side that shows a picture of your commitment to Christ, doesn't it make sense that the two of them fit together? Baptism says, I want to be obedient to Jesus. Church membership says, I want to be committed to Christ and each other and on mission. The two of them make sense going together. You might say, well, I don't think baptism should be part of church membership. It's like you're getting baptized to join a social club. It's hypocritical to be baptized in order to join a social club. But think about that for a second. Guys, I don't pastor a social club. That's not what God's called us to do. We do a lot of social stuff together. We eat a lot together. That's what we're good at. But we're, we're not a social club. We're a church. We're a community of faith, a gathering of believers who have united together in our love for Jesus, our love for one another, and our love for the world. How can we ever do that if you don't want to obey Jesus by being baptized? How can you love Christ if you disobey his command and not follow his example? How can we love one another if we're not willing to be identified with each other according to Scripture? And how can we ever obey the command of Jesus to go into the world and make disciples and baptize people if we're not willing to be baptized ourselves? Basically, there is no way you can separate baptism from commitment to Jesus, 
much less his mission in the church. Remember, I said this earlier, church, baptism isn't a church membership issue. It's an obedience issue. This is a matter of you placing your faith in Jesus and showing that this act in Scripture places a lot of significance in your life. And so I encourage you this morning, if you're not baptized, be baptized because you want to obey Jesus, because you love Jesus, and you want to follow Jesus. And so three reasons why we get baptized, to follow the example of Jesus, to obey the command of Jesus, and to be united with the body of Christ. Second question, what's the meaning of baptism? And I'll pick up here quick. When someone is baptized, what does that mean? Again, three things there. Number one, I think it's a celebration of God's grace. When you get a chance in your free time, read Colossians 2. The passage talks about how Christ died on the cross and he canceled our sins and canceled the debt of our sin on the cross and he rose triumphantly over the rulers and powers and the authorities of this world. What that means is Christ died as our substitute. You should have died. I should have died. I should have paid the penalty for my sin. But Christ took my place. You'll see, hear me say this a lot here. You'll hear me say, Jesus lived the life that we should have lived. He died the death that we should have died so that me and you can be called the children of God. He paid the price for your sins and my sins. Colossians 2 is now identifying that with baptism. And that's not all the passage says. It says, not only did he die for our sins, but he triumphed over sin. He rose from the grave as our Savior. He rose from the grave as our Savior. The text says that Christ was made a public spectacle in front of all the rulers and the authorities of the world. He made them look like fools because he conquered sin and death and the grave. That's the basis of our baptism. It's a celebration of the grace of Christ shown to us at the cross when he died in our place. What that means is that baptism isn't a requirement for salvation. It's not something you do to get saved. It's not something you do so you can make it to heaven. There are some groups that teach that, but that's not what scriptures teach at all. Scriptures teach that this is a celebration of the grace of God, not something we do. If we have to be baptized in order to be saved, what do you tell the thief on the cross? What do you tell that person that's hanging there? He trusts in Jesus, saying, Jesus looks at him, well, he says, well, tough luck. If you had just trusted me right before you got crucified, maybe we could have dunked you quickly and then got crucified, and then you could be with me in eternity in heaven. But that's not what Jesus says at all, does it? He says, today you will be with me in paradise. Baptism is a celebration of the grace of Christ. Second thing, it's an illustration of the gospel. Romans 6 says, we have been buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God, we too might walk in newness of life. The imagery here is that baptism, we are illustrating what Christ has done for us. When we go into the water, we are identifying with the death of Jesus. That's the picture that baptism gives here. When we come out of the water, it's a picture of us being given brand new life. It's a picture of us dying to our sins, our wants, ourselves, and just as Christ was put into the tomb, we go down, but when we come out, we are brand new. We're made brand new individuals. That's the illustration of the gospel. This is the gospel story. He was in the grave for three days, and he rose from the grave. When he comes out of the water, we're illustrating that we participate in the resurrection. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel story. Now, I want you to see a picture. I'm going to have Mike put a picture behind me. There should be a picture behind me. And no? Okay. If it shows up, it's a picture of my two kids. Wow, that's not my two kids. Um, it's, it's a picture of my two kids with uh, Mickey Mouse, right? Um, so imagine with me, I've got my two older kids are the most phenomenal kids in the world um, when they sleep, um, but, uh, and Mickey Mouse. The picture, oh, there you are. Um, you will say that's my picture, but that's, and that's my kids, but that's not my kids. That's a representation of my kids. My kids are probably bossing everyone else around in kids' church right now. Um, and... And those of you who are smart know that that's not Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse really lives in 
uh, Mickey Mouse's clubhouse, right? Um, that's where he lives. Um, and that's just a representation of him. And so what you see, when you see someone getting baptized, you're not seeing their salvation. You're seeing a representation of their salvation. It's an illustration representing what Christ has done for them. I've died to my sins, and because of Jesus, I'm brand new. It's just an illustration, a representation. It's a celebration of grace. It's an illustration of the gospel. Third, it's a proclamation of the work of Christ, of the glory of Christ. It's a proclamation of the glory of Christ. In 1 Peter 3, Peter is talking about baptism and how Christ in salvation and our baptism by proclaiming God's glory to the whole world. It talks about how Christ has all authority in all the world, and he is declaring his authority through the salvation of his people, and we see that pictured in baptism for us. So when we are baptized, we proclaim his glory on two levels. Number one, we proclaim it to the church. Going back to the first point when I talked about how we're united with the family, when someone is baptized, it's a picture of them saying to all of us in the church, hey, I'm with you. I'm part of you. I'm together in this with you. We're united. I know that's a stretch in our individualistic culture that we live in where everything is about us, but the gospel doesn't allow us to be self-centered. It calls us to be in community. The good news is that gospel says we're in this together. It teaches us that we need each other, that we are community, that we are family. And when we are baptized, we are saying to one another, I'm in this with you. I'm in this with you. We're in this together. I will have your back. I'll take care of you. I'll love you. We are family. But it's also a proclamation to the world. It is telling the world that you have placed your faith in Jesus, that he is the Lord and Savior of your life. So that's what baptism means. We celebrate his grace. We illustrate the gospel. We proclaim his glory in the church and in the world. All right, next question. How should I be baptized? How should I be baptized? Here at Loft City, we believe that immersion is the most biblical way to be baptized. We get that from the word baptism itself. The word baptism comes from the word baptizo, which basically means to submerge or dunk or wash something away by putting it under water. This is the picture of baptism in the New Testament. This is why when John started taking people into, um, to get baptized, he took them into the Jordan River, baptized them, and then they walked out. This is how Jesus was baptized. Mark says, Jesus was coming out of the water. Not only Jesus, but this is how the New Testament church leaders baptized. In Acts 8, we see a story of an Ethiopian who is driving down the road, and he's reading, trying to read scripture, and Philip shows up and explains the scriptures to him. And then he sees a body of water. He stops the chariot. He says, hey, there's a body of water. Can I go and get baptized? Philip didn't say, well, you stay here. Let me go and grab a cup of water, and I'll come back and pour it on top of you. That's not what Philip does at all. He actually takes the Ethiopian. They go into the body of water. They are baptized. And that's, you see that throughout the example and throughout scriptures. You see Jesus did that. You see the examples of the New Testament. But when you th think about it, this is the best illustration of the gospel that we see in scripture. When you go into the water, you're identifying with the death of Jesus. When you come out, you are participating in his resurrection. This is what the scripture is teaching, and if baptism is an illustration of the gospel, then immersion, we believe, is the most biblical way to get baptized. Now, I know there's some of you in this room that come from different denominational backgrounds, and some of you come from a religious tradition where you were baptized as a believer after you placed in your faith in Jesus, but you weren't baptized by immersion. Maybe you had someone pour water on you or something along those lines. And what I don't want you to hear this morning me saying is that your baptism is invalid. That's not what I'm saying at all. If we go there, then we kind of become very legalistic and we miss the meaning of baptism. Yeah, last night I was trying to convince my wife to come early um, so that I could practice baptizing her because I haven't done, um, done this in a while. And so she started arguing with me. She's like, I was actually baptized three times. And I'm like, Three times? How bad were you? What, what do I not know about you? Um, and so she was like, apparently, um, when she was being dunked in, she didn't go all the way down the first two times, so they had to dip her in the, three, the third time. And so I was like, 
So I was like, oh, so you got baptized in the name of the Father, and then you got baptized in the name of the Son, and then you got baptized in the name of the Holy Spirit. No wonder whatever you say has to happen. No wonder, you're just like God to me. I mean, no wonder I have, it's a wise for me to listen to you the first time. It makes sense now. And so um, that's legalistic. That doesn't make sense. I mean, it's not about how well you do it. It's about the image behind it. I was in Kenya two years ago. Uh, we were at the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro. The closest body of water to baptize someone is two to three days walking distance. There's no way people are going to walk two to three days just to get dunked in a body of water and then walk back to their village. doesn't make sense. We had to grab water from a well, pour it on top of them to illustrate that they were, um, their sins were washed away, that they belonged to Jesus. It's not about method. It's about what it communicates. Does that make sense? It's about communicating that you belong to Jesus that you've died to your sins, and now you, now you live a new life for Jesus. Fourth question, who should be baptized? Let me go through this real quick. I forgot to mention I have a third child. Um, <laughs> anyone who has repented of their sin and placed their faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior should be baptized. This is the answer that Scripture gives. That's what happens in Acts 2. As soon as you have placed your faith in Jesus, you are baptized. As soon as you repented of your sins, you are baptized. Repent means to turn away from your sins, turn away from yourself, and now live for Jesus. That's what baptism signifies for us. So repentance and faith are a requirement for baptism. What it means is that we don't baptize infants here. Again, I know some of you come from a tradition where that happened. But based on what we see in Scripture, we don't baptize because infants do not have the ability or the opportunity to come to the point where they place their faith in Christ or repent of their sins. I'm not sure what sins you would have at two weeks old anyway, right, to baptize an infant. Um, that's not what Scripture is teaching. This is a personal faith in Jesus. Your heritage is important. And it's great that you're born into homes where your parents were followers of Jesus. But there comes a point in your life where you have to personally repent of your sins and decide, I am now going to follow Jesus. I am going to publicly declare I no longer live for myself. I repent of my sins. I now live for Jesus and Jesus alone. That's what we're going to see happen this morning when believers get baptized. And we call that believer's baptism. Believer's baptism. Some of you, because of your background, you might have gone through a confirmation class or something along those lines with the tradition that you grew up in. What about that? Should I get baptized if I was confirmed? What if I was baptized at a young age because all my friends were getting baptized but only recently started taking my faith seriously and obeying Jesus? Should I get rebaptized? I'll let you answer the question, but I'll pose a question for you. We said we believe in believer's baptism. So the question is, when did you place your faith in Jesus? When did you truly trust Christ to forgive you of your sins? If you can identify that point in your life, if you were baptized before then, that wasn't believer's baptism. If you know when you put your faith in Christ and started living for him, you were baptized after that. That's what we believe is believer's baptism. Maybe you say, well, I didn't get baptized immediately after. Doesn't mean you're disqualified. It is, if you have faith, if you repented, you are qualified to be baptized. And if we do it, if we do it before we place our faith in Christ and repent, then we really aren't baptized into believer's baptism. It's not that we need to get rebaptized. You don't need to get baptized a million times. You just need to get baptized once, but you do it after you put your faith and trust in Jesus. Hope that makes sense. Number, next question, when should I get baptized? The Bible teaches that we should get baptized as soon as we put our faith in Jesus. I want you to draw your attention to Acts 8. Here we're going to see a pattern in the New Testament because somewhere along the way we have created this idea that baptism is kind of optional for us. You wait for a long time after you get baptized. You prove yourself after you get baptized. That's not what Scripture teaches at all. We'll see this throughout Scripture. And I don't have time to highlight all of this, but let me point some of these out. We talked about the Ethiopian eunuch. He believed in Jesus. 
Philip immediately baptized him. In verse 36, he says, baptize me now, he's baptized. In Acts 9, we see Paul or Saul getting converted. He gets saved immediately, gets baptized. Acts 16, there's a woman by the name of Lydia who is a key leader in the city of Philippi. She gets saved immediately. They baptize her. In Acts 16, verse 33, there's a story of the jailer. And you know the story, Peter and Silas were, uh, Paul and Silas were singing in the jail. Uh, everything shook and they got freed. Um, and the jailer started freaking out. They brought the jailer to Christ. Him and his family immediately, that night itself, gave their lives to Jesus, got baptized. And there are references after references where you see they put your faith in Jesus. Immediately afterward, you see them get baptized. Some of you have put your faith in Christ a long, long time ago, and you haven't been baptized yet. It doesn't mean that you are disqualified or anything, but it does mean that it's time for you to be obedient to Jesus. It's time for you to obey him. It's time for you to stop making excuses, and if you're really a follower of Jesus, Say, I'm going to obey what Jesus tells me to do. And based on the testimony of Scripture, I would add one more thing. Not only as soon as you place your faith in Jesus, but as soon as you can best publicly proclaim your faith in Christ. Because of what baptism is, it's a celebration of grace. It's an illustration of the gospel. It's a proclamation of God's glory. It is telling the church and the world that we have submitted our lives to Jesus, that we have trusted in Jesus, and that we have talked and we talked about how baptism is an illustration of the gospel, and we are illustrating to the world that Jesus died for me and rose again for me. Here's the deal. When these individuals are baptized this morning, that's probably the moment more than any other moment in their life where they will proclaim to more people at one time what Jesus has done for them. That's what's going to happen. Many of you guys are not going to become evangelists that are going all over the globe and preaching to masses crowds. You're going to live ordinary lives that bring glory to God in everything that you do. What you do this morning, you are proclaiming to this crowd that you belong to Jesus. You are proclaiming the gospel this morning to the crowd. So as soon as you can best publicly proclaim your faith in Jesus, you get baptized. In a few moments, you're going to hear a testimony of individuals who have given their lives to Jesus and want to be baptized. You're going to hear them talk about how Christ has changed their lives. And you're going to see a picture of the gospel when they're baptized. My prayer this morning is there might be some of you here that the Holy Spirit is working on you. And you're saying, Pastor Sam, I haven't been baptized yet. I've been disobedient to Jesus. I want to get baptized. I want to obey Jesus. I love Jesus with my heart. I want to get baptized as well. Let me invite you. If you feel like God's calling you to get baptized, don't wait another day. If you have put your faith in Jesus, if you have repented of your sins, today is the day for you to be obedient. You're going to say, oh, I don't have any clothes. I'm going to go home wet. That's okay. We'll buy clothes from you next door. It might be scrubs, but that's okay. You can... Go home in scrubs and celebrate that Jesus is working in your life. So if you haven't been baptized this morning, when the guys come up to share their testimony and you feel like God's calling you to be baptized as well, join them. Share what God is doing in your life and we'll celebrate with you this morning. Bottom line, baptism is a declaration to the world that we belong to Jesus. It is a declaration to the world that we belong to Jesus. That means what we're doing this morning is more than just a sign. It's more than just a symbol or more than just a ritual. It's a declaration to everyone that I belong to Jesus. On my finger here, I have a ring. It's a wedding ring. 11 years and a month ago, I stood at the altar next to the most beautiful woman on the earth. And I made a vow to her that we would be committed for the rest of our lives together. The ring that I wear on my finger is a symbol. But it is so much more than a symbol. It is a declaration to the world that I belong to her and she belongs to me. Now, when you see me Anywhere that I go, you will see me with this, ring, with this ring on my finger. 
It's a declaration that I belong to her. And when you see the rock on her finger, it's a declaration that she belongs to me. Listen, in a much deeper way, the God of the universe has reached down his divine hand into our lives. He has initiated a relationship with us. It is a love relationship. He has pursued you with passion. The passion was so great that there was sin that was separating you from him. And he didn't let that stop it. He sent his son and said, take care of that. And his son had to die for your sins. He was, and he has united our lives together. And he gives us this picture in the church that says to the world, we belong to Jesus. And when we are baptized, when we give ourselves to that picture, we celebrate his grace and we illustrate the gospel that Jesus is more precious to me than gold or silver or family or friends or anything that Jesus is worth living for. And we publicly told the world, I belong to him. We proclaim that he is our God, that his salvation belongs to us, so that everyone will know that he is good, that he is God, that he is worthy. So in light of all of that, I got to ask you, why would you not want to be baptized? It's an incredible picture. The passion of Christ and our passion for him uniting together and assembles a declaration that we belong to him. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to celebrate grace. And we're going to see the illustration of the gospel being illustrated to you. And we are going to proclaim his glory. There are several people that are getting baptized this morning. As of right now, there's 12. But if God's working in your heart, I invite you to join as well. And as the worship team sings this morning, they're going to sing one song. And during that time, I'm going to invite those who have made a commitment to get baptized to join me right in front of the baptistry. And at that point, after they're done, they're going to share their testimony. And then we're going to pray over them. And then we're going to baptize them. So I'm going to invite you to stand. Those of you who are um, getting baptized, would you come join me in the front and let's just worship Jesus.